Hi everyone, this is a re-recording of a talk that I gave at GopherCon in October 2023. It's about why Go has to change over time, how we approach the process of changing Go, and why opt-in telemetry is an important and appropriate part of that process. Enjoy! This talk is not about any particular Go changes, but about the overall process of change, specifically how we decide which changes to make. The obvious first question is why does Go need to change at all? Why can't we just be happy with Go and leave it alone? The easy answer is that we don't always get things right the first time, like in this picture of the first plush Go Gopher compared to the final version that we gave out at GopherCon. But there's a deeper answer. A former colleague of mine used an email signature for many years with a quote from the biologist and science fiction author Jack Cohen. In the quote, Cohen says, there is this special biologist word we use for stable, and that word is dead. Everything that is alive changes, adapting to new surroundings, repairing injuries, and so on. Programming environments require change too. Unless we want Go to die, it needs to adapt to new surroundings, like new protocols, new operating systems, and new important use cases. And we need to fix bugs we discover, along with language, library, and ecosystem problems that become apparent only over time, or only once Go has gotten to a particular age or size. Go has to change to improve and keep up. This talk is about how we decide which changes to make. There are three parts to this talk. The first part is about what kinds of changes we want and don't want for Go. The second part is about how we use data to decide which changes to make. And the third part is about our plan to add opt-in telemetry to the Go toolchain to better understand how Go is being used and when it's misbehaving. By the end of the talk, You'll understand our process for thinking about and deciding on changes for Go. You'll understand the importance of data to make those decisions. And I hope you'll understand why opt-in telemetry is a good additional source of data and maybe even be willing to opt in as the system rolls out. Let's start with this. What kinds of changes do we want for Go? If we don't agree on this basic point, we can't agree on specific changes either. For example, should we add a Perl statement to Go that lets us write functions in Perl? I think we shouldn't, but suppose you disagree. To resolve that, we need to understand why we disagree. John Ousterhout wrote a wonderful document titled Open Decision Making about his experience running startups, but which applies almost exactly to working on open source projects too. One of the most important points he makes is this. If a collection of smart people all look at the same problem with the same information, and if they have the same goals, then they're likely to reach the same conclusion. If you and I disagree about embedding Perl in Go, the root cause is almost certainly that we have different goals for Go. So we have to establish what Go's goals are. Go's goal is better software engineering, especially at scale. Nearly all of Go's distinctive design decisions are aimed at that. We've said this often, including in these two articles. Again, Go's goal is better software engineering. Now what about Perl? 20 years ago, when I was younger and more naive and Go didn't exist, I wrote and deployed a significant distributed system written entirely in Perl. I love Perl for what it is, but it's not aiming at better software engineering. If we disagree about that, then maybe I should define what I mean by software engineering. I like to say, that software engineering is what happens to programming when you add time and other programmers. Programming means getting a program working. You have a problem to solve, you write some code, you run it, you debug it, you get your answer, you're done. That's programming and that's difficult enough. But what happens when that code has to keep working day after day, even with other people working on it? Then you need to add tests to make sure bugs you fix are not reintroduced later, not by you six months from now, not by that new team member who's unfamiliar with the code. This is why Go has provided built-in support for tests from day one, and why we established a culture of always adding tests with any bug fix or new code that we add. So what happens when your code has to keep working year after year, even as Go changes? Then we need to emphasize compatibility, which Go has since Go 1. In fact, Go 121 shipped many compatibility improvements, which I previewed at GopherCon in 2022. What happens when you have a lot of code and it needs some kind of global cleanup? You need tools, and the inevitable first stumbling block is that those tools need to make changes 
that mimic the formatting style of the code they edit to avoid spurious diffs. GoFumpt exists to enable tools like Go Imports, Go Rename, Go Fix, and Go Please, as well as custom tools you might write yourself with the packages we provide. Speaking of which, when you use packages that other people provide, the inevitable first stumbling block is that multiple people will write packages with the same names, like SQLite or YAML. How do we identify which one to use in a given program? Go's import paths are URLs in order to answer that question in a decentralized, unambiguous way. As time goes on, the next problems are picking which version of a specific package to use and deciding whether that version works with all your other dependencies. This is why Go provides modules and workspaces and the Go module mirror and the Go checksum database. The next problem is that everyone's code has bugs, including security bugs. You need to find out about the most important bugs so that you know to update to fixed versions. This is why we added the Go vulnerability database and Go VulnCheck, which Julie also talked about at GopherCon, and I'll add a link to that video when it's available. Those are large examples, but there are also small ones, like adding new protocols like HTTP3, or removing support for outdated platforms and fixing or deprecating error-prone APIs to avoid common mistakes, especially in large code bases. This takes us to the Go proposal process, which is how we make decisions about which changes are accepted and which are declined. When we think about those decisions, it turns out that using data is very important for reaching consensus. Very briefly, anyone can file a Go change proposal on Go's GitHub issue tracker. Then a discussion happens on that issue where we try to reach a consensus among the participants about whether to accept or decline the proposal or how to change it so that it can be accepted. Over time, we've come to appreciate the importance of a second phrase in John Ousterhout's observation. Consensus is likely when the people looking at the problem have shared goals, but also shared information. In the very early days of Go, there were just a few of us making decisions. We based them on technical judgment and intuition informed by our past experiences. Those experiences were the information we were using. We reached consensus most of the time because our past experiences overlapped enough. Most small projects work this way. As decisions scale to many more people, there's not as much shared experience. We need a new source of shared information. The best source we found is to gather actual data and then make that data the shared information we use. But where do we get that data? For Go, we have many potential sources, each of them suited to specific kinds of decisions. Let me show you a few of them. One source of data is talking to Go users. We do this in a variety of ways. First, there's the Go user survey, which we've done every year since 2016 and recently started doing twice a year. The survey is good for understanding the most popular uses of Go and the most common problems that people face. For many years, the most common problems were the lack of dependency management and the lack of generics. And we use that information to prioritize developing Go modules and then generics. Another source of data is the surveys that we can run inside VS Code using the VS Code Go plugin. These surveys help us understand how well the VS Code Go experience works. And the final source of data, direct from users, is research interviews and user experience studies that we conduct throughout the year. These let us start to identify patterns or get more information about specific topics from a small group. But surveys and interviews gather data by talking to users. Another data source is reading code. We can analyze the open source Go modules that have been published. For example, before adding a new Go vet check, we run it on a subset of the open source corpus and then read a random sample of the results to see whether the check is pointing out real problems and whether it has too many false positives. For Go 122, we're planning to add a Go vet check for calls to append that append nothing at all. And here are two code snippets that were flagged by the check. The top one suggests that perhaps the developer believes append always makes a copy of its input slice. And the bottom one is perhaps correct, but awkwardly phrased. Here are another two. In the top one, either the for loop doesn't run or it never finishes because the length of e.sigs is never going to change. The bottom one also seems like a clear bug. The code is carefully deciding which list to append a message to, and then it doesn't append it to either one. Since all the flagged code snippets we sampled were questionable or outright bugs, we decided to add the check. Data was much better here than intuition. All these approaches are working on a small number of samples. For a typical code analysis, I like to read 100 samples, which is a minuscule fraction of all the Go code in the world. 
The last Go developer survey had under 6,000 respondents out of maybe 3 million Go developers in the world, less than 1% of them. A good question is why these tiny fractions tell us anything about the larger populations they're drawn from. And the answer is that sampling accuracy only depends on the number of samples, not how big the overall population is. This seems counterintuitive at first, but suppose I have a giant box of a million gophers and I pull out two of them at random. First I get one blue gopher, then I get one pink gopher. Based on these two samples, I estimate that the box is approximately half blue and half pink. Now how surprised would you be if I told you the box is equal parts pink, blue, and gray? Not too surprised. If the box is one third pink, blue, and gray, then each of those nine pairs is equally likely. The chance of getting one not gray gopher is two thirds. The chance of getting two is two thirds squared or four ninths. Not seeing a gray is going to happen almost half the time. That's why it's not very surprising. Now suppose I pull 100 out and there are 48 blue and 52 pink. And again, I estimate the box is roughly half blue and half pink. Now how surprised would you be if I told you the box was equal parts pink, blue, and gray? You should be a lot more surprised. In fact, you shouldn't believe me at all. If that was true, the chance of getting 100 not gray in a row is 2 thirds to the power 100, which is around 10 to the minus 48. Random chance cannot be the right explanation. Either I'm lying about the box, or I'm not pulling them out randomly. Maybe all the gray gophers are at the bottom and I'm not reaching deep enough. Notice that none of this depends on how many gophers are in the box. It only depends on how many we pull out. The math for the accuracy of specific predictions is more complex, but it has the same effect. Only the number of samples matters, not the number of gophers in the box. In general, the math is too difficult to calculate by hand. So here's a table you can find on my blog. It says that if you take 100 samples and estimate percentages based on those, then 90% of the time, your estimates will be within 8% of the true percentages. And 99% of the time, they'll be within 13%. If you have 5,000 samples, like in the Go survey, 90% of the time, the estimate will be within 1%, and 99% of the time, it will be within 2%. One caveat is that the samples do need to be random, or at least not correlated with what you're estimating. You can't only pull gophers from the top of the box and then make a claim about the entire box. If you avoid that mistake, then when you're trying to estimate whether a new API will be useful or whether a particular vet check is worthwhile, it's reasonable to spend an hour or so examining 100 samples by hand. If it's a bad idea, that will be apparent very quickly. And if it looks like a good idea, Spending another couple hours checking more samples, either by hand or with a program, will improve your estimates considerably. This is a very small cost compared to the cost of making a bad decision. In short, the magic of sampling is that sampling turns many one-off estimations into jobs that are feasible to do by hand or with small amounts of data. This is why all the data sources we've seen already manage to represent the entire Go developer population reasonably well. And that brings me to the third part of the talk, telemetry in the Go tool chain. Telemetry is also going to be a small sample of Go developer usage, but it should be a representative one and it answers different questions than surveys and code analysis do. Telemetry is always a contentious topic, especially for open source projects. So let me start with the most important detail. Uploading telemetry reports is entirely voluntary and opt-in. No data will be uploaded without you running an explicit command to opt in to that data collection. This is also not the kind of telemetry system that uploads detailed traces of everything you do. This telemetry also only applies to the commands that we distribute as part of the Go distribution. Things like go please, the go command, the compiler. It does not go into any of the programs that you build. After I've described the system in more detail, I hope you'll find that you would be comfortable opting into this telemetry system. In fact, the primary design constraint we gave ourselves was to make the system something we would be willing to opt into, even if someone else were running it. As I'm recording this in November 2023, the system is just starting to run with just a few people who've been asked to opt in inside VS Code Go to Go Please telemetry. So overall, you can't opt in today, but hopefully soon you will be able to. Before we get into the details, 
The motivation for telemetry is that it provides different information than surveys and code analysis do. And the main two categories that it provides are usage information and breakage information. Surveys let us ask broad questions about Go usage, but they're not great for detailed usage information. That would be too many questions, and it's a waste of time for respondents to answer no to 90% of them. This slide shows a list of things we've removed from Go after warning about the removals in earlier release notes. The last item on the list, build mode equals shared, is something we tried to remove, but after pre-announcing the removal, at least one user objected and we left it in. Even so, build mode equals shared basically doesn't work with Go modules, and so it seems unlikely that it has much usage at all. But we don't have data, so it just lingers in the code base. Telemetry could provide us basic usage information so that we can make those decisions with data, not guesses. The other important category is breakage information. If the Go toolchain is obviously broken, we expect to get a bug report on GitHub. But the Go toolchain can also be broken in subtle ways that users don't notice. One example is that Go 114 through 119 on Mac OS accidentally shipped with standard library package binaries that had been pre-built with non-default compile flags. This made them look out of date, which made the Go command recompile them when it ran, which meant that if your program imported net, you needed a C compiler from Xcode to build the program. We intend Go to be able to build pure Go programs by itself with no other tool chains required, so requiring Xcode was a bug. But we didn't notice, and no users reported it on GitHub. Anyone who ran into this pop-up apparently just installed Xcode and went on with their day. Now, telemetry can provide basic performance metrics like standard library cache hit rate so that Go toolchain developers notice a problem like this even when users don't. Another example is internal compiler crashes. The Go compiler doesn't stop at the first error in your program. It keeps going, trying to find and report as many different errors as possible. But sometimes, continuing to analyze a program with known errors causes unexpected panics. We don't want to show users a crash like this. Instead, the compiler recovers from the panic and only reports the errors it had already found. That way, a Go user can correct those errors, which will probably also correct the hidden panic. The user's work is not interrupted by seeing a compiler crash. That's good for users, but Go toolchain developers still want to know about that crash and fix the bug. Telemetry can make sure we find out about the bug, even though users don't find out. To gather usage and breakage information, the Go telemetry design records counters and crashes. A Go toolchain program like the Go command or the Go compiler or Go please can define named event counters and then increment the counters when they happen. Events can also be counted separately by stack trace. These counters are maintained in local on disk files for a week at a time. On the slide, Go please and other tools are writing counters to the weekly files. Once a week, an uploader program in the Go toolchain will fetch an upload configuration from the telemetry server, which lists the specific event names being collected that week. That configuration is changed only after consensus is reached in a telemetry-specific proposal review process. The configuration is served as a module to protect the integrity of the download and keep a public record of past configurations. The uploader then uploads only the counters listed in the upload configuration. On the slide, the uploader is sending back only a report for Go Please, with only a few counters, even though many more might be on disk. In the report, there are statistics about which editors Go Please is being used with and about the latency of completion requests. And there is one Go Please slash bug event that happened once and includes a stack trace. Notice that there are no event traces or any user data at all in the uploads, only counts, event names that are already listed in the public upload configuration, and function names from inside Go toolchain programs. Note also that the stack traces don't include any arguments to functions, only the function names, so there's no user data in them. Telemetry and open source can create an information imbalance between those who have access to the data and those who don't, and we want to avoid that. Remember Ousterhout's rule. To reach consensus, we need everyone to have the same information. Because Go's telemetry uploads don't contain any sensitive data and are collected with a clear opt-in consent, we can republish those reports in full so that anyone can do any data analysis they want. We'll also publish basic graphs that we'll be using to make decisions. The only thing we could possibly see that we're not republishing 
is which IP addresses the reports came from. And our server does not log that information with the reports. An obvious question is whether enough people will opt into telemetry to make the data accurate enough to make decisions. And luckily, the magic of sampling helps here. There are about 3 million Go developers in the world. When the system is ready and we ask people to enable telemetry, even a tenth of a percent opt-in rate would be 3,000 developers, which our chart says is under 3% error with 99% confidence. If two-thirds of a percent of the Go developers in the world enable telemetry, that would be 20,000 samples, which is under 1% error with 99% confidence. Beyond that, we don't really need more samples. If we consistently get more reports, we can adjust the upload configuration to tell systems to randomly choose not to upload anything in a given week. For example, if it appears that 200,000 systems have opted in, we can tell each one to upload with probability 10% in any given week. So the system should work very well, even though we expect opt-in rates to be low. And as opt-in rates go up, GoTelemetry will collect less data from any given system. Of course, that makes each person who opts in that much more important to us. GoTelemetry is, for the most part, not ready for any of you to opt in yet. But when it is, I hope you will. Finishing up, this is what I hope you've taken from the talk. First, Go needs to keep changing, especially as the computing world changes around it. Second, the goal for any changes is to make Go better for software engineering, especially at scale. Third, once we agree on the goal, the next most important part of reaching consensus for any change is having shared data to base the decision on. Fourth, Go toolchain telemetry is an important source of data to augment our existing survey and code analysis data. And finally, while this entire talk has been about data and proper statistics, the ideas and hypotheses and potential changes we're evaluating always start with individual stories and conversations. We love hearing those stories and talking to all of you about how you use Go, about what's working and what isn't working. So please, no matter what the context, if you're at a conference or on a mailing list or on an issue tracker, please make sure that you let us know how Go is working for you, what isn't working. We always love to hear that. Thanks very much.